This is Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm here with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And this is another edition of Gilbert and Frank's Amazing Colossal Obsessions. And we're talking to the man who wanted to be Sid Bernstein in Beverly Hills Cop 2. Sandy Helberg is here. Sandy yes. Helberg. Yes. Sandy, character actor extraordinaire. Yes. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. A uh, character actor, like I said, uh, they told me I was too Jewish to play him. I actually... Uh, you, you auditioned for Beverly Hills Cop 2 in the part of Sidney Bernstein. That's right. And they told me I was too Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go see the movie, and the rabbi here is playing the part. <laughs> if they're doing a new uh, Fiddler on the Roof, if they tell me I'm too Jewish, then I will quit the business. They really told John... Who, who directed that picture? Oh, Martin Brest. They told you you're too Jewish. No, no. No, that the was second. Uh, oh, the second the one. Uh, 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 yeah, Tony Scott. Yeah. Tony oh, Scott. Who jumped yeah. off a bridge. I know, like, and Scott. nobody knows exactly what was going on with him. Yeah. yeah. He just <laughs> took a dive and... Uh, yeah, that was the sound he made. <laughs> 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 when he hit the wall. Yeah. <laughs> by, by the way... Now, now I, I heard... That the part of Sidney Bernstein, maybe they would have changed the name, right. but they had originally asked, while he was still welcome in Hollywood, they had originally asked Roberto Benigni. Oh, my God. Oh. That's he, weird. He, How is Roberto Benigni going to play Sidney Bernstein? Yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't even it. speak English, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yiddish. He, he was someone who wore out his welcome Quickly. Really too, too Jewish. Fast. Too Jewish. You too know, Jewish when he climbed over the chairs to get his Oscar, they said, this That's guy's weird. out. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that was, you were so great in that part. You really yeah. made that your own. <laughs> See? This is why I yeah. keep Frank around. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he reminds you of all I thought you had a nice Sandy Helberg quality. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In that part. Yeah. By the way, you're also, speaking of Helberg Gottfried Productions, you're also both in Meet Wally Sparks. Yes. Oh, oh my, my God. God. <laughs> yes. That was a brilliant film. Oh, it was, nobody was directing the movie. It was, yeah. Uh, what's his name was directing it? Um, uh, his friend. Oh, the comedian. Uh, Harry Basil. Uh, yes, Harry yes. Basil. Can't believe right. I know that. But the original director was a TV uh, director I'd worked with, Peter Baldwin. Yeah. And he oh, I hired, worked with Peter Baldwin. Yeah. yeah. And he just hired me. I didn't have to read. And I go there, and Peter's sitting in the corner on a chair reading a magazine. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, go over and talk to the director. And it was... Uh, Harry. So one can assume that Rodney used his muscle to get the uh, the original director pushed out for his buddy. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he still uh, Peter still took uh, sole credit, which I think was a mistake. But did, uh, did Harry Basil also direct Back by Midnight? I I think he did a Dangerfield ooh, picture or two. I, I was in Back I by know. Midnight. I know that <laughs> that Back by Midnight made Meet Wally Sparks look like Citizen Kane. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. But, no, I haven't even... Se I'm saying that uh, just from see, yeah. acting it out. I've never seen the movie. And I'd be scared We to. had Ed Begley on the show. You know Ed. Yeah. And Ed was in it, too, and they discussed how neither of them have ever seen it. I don't think uh, yeah. Harry Basil has seen it. You yeah. know, I don't think he saw it when he was making it. Good guy, uh, Peter Baldwin, by the way. I worked on a sitcom with him. He died last year. I think we lost him. Yeah, yeah. I worked uh, on a couple episodes of Newhart. Quite Heart, a resume. Newhart with him. He started out as an actor. Yeah. He's great looking. I, worked, I wrote on a very forgettable sitcom he directed. Which was a... Good man. Oh, let's Rod not, let's Rodney not let's Dangerfield go Rodney Dangerfield is one of those people... That, like, I mean, I, I love to see the old guys around, oh. but, boy, he, I wish he had retired earlier. Yeah, you, th you think so? He would go on, like, the Tonight Show right. when Jay Leno was the host. Uh-huh. And it's like, you know, you remember when how great he was on oh. Carson. He yes. would be like... A mile a minute. He didn't have any conversation. Yeah. Johnny said, how's your health? And he would do yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah, you've got to take care of your health, Johnny. <laughs> he said, I was, I'm all right now. But last week, yeah. I was yeah. Oh, it was tough. And, yeah. and he would come out, do a set. Right. And then sit down on the panel, and that was another set. Right, yeah. right, right, right. But right. then it Those just the looked days. like, you know, he would come on, and it looked like he didn't, you know, just... Can he get through the sentence? Yeah, yeah. He, I ran into him years ago at Musso's 
with uh, Richard Lewis. Yeah. And I, came, I said, hello to Richard and, and Rodney, and Rodney's eating. I said, what are you eating there? And he had a plate of herring. Yeah. He said, I'm eating my heritage here. And he was eating the thing, and uh, he should have quit then. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe the drugs took their toll. I think oh, they did. Sure. After a while. But Sandy has had a fascinating career, Gilbert. In addition to being beaten out uh, by, by you. you for Beverly Hills Cup. <laughs> I've been beaten by a lot of people. He's but. in Spaceballs, very memorably. He's in High Anxiety, Chevy Chase's Modern Problems. He's in. He's one of the disciples in History of the World wow. with John Hurt playing Jesus. And he's in the original Gopher from the Love Boat pilot. Movie. Oh, too Jewish. Too Jewish. <laughs> yeah. After they saw me standing next to Dick Van Patten and Cloris Leachman, and uh, what happened? Cloris Leachman gave you a hard time. She gave me a very hard time because uh, I, uh, she and uh, Tom uh, Bosley. Bosley. Yeah, yeah uh, Tom Bosley. They played a husband and wife on the Love Boat, and I had some scenes with her. And every time they yelled "cut." She turned around and go over to the director and point to me and say, "My son is much better than he is." Ooh. Her son had read for the part. <laughs> oh, God, every oh. scene she, you know, he would have been so much better in that part, you know. Oh. But uh, you know what? That's, that's was, heartbreaking because we love Cloris Leachman. Yeah, uh, I do too. She, I think she's a great actress. Just uh, you know, it was my first job. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the and that was Dick Van Patten was in the captain the he, captain's role. Uh, no, Dick Van Patten played the doctor. Oh, he played the doctor. He was in Bernie Copel's oh, part. Okay. Yes, right. And the captain was an Australian, an guy, unknown actor, an unknown, still yeah. unknown. Yeah, the girl uh, is an unknown from New York right. and uh, still unknown. Teddy Wilson. Teddy uh, Wilson, Wilson from the, uh, yeah, he was on. He was on. That's my mama. Yes, yes, I think so. Playing, he was great. Playing uh, Isaac, Isaac, the bartender. Yeah. And there were other characters. There was a couple, married couple. They were the ship entertainment. It was Dick Stahl and his wife. Richard Stahl. Oh, yeah, Richard yes, Stahl. yes, yes, yes. He, he would always pop up on the odd couple. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes, right. funny guy. So, All, they, so they cut them out, you know, those characters out. Uh, the entertainment couple and... Uh, and, you know, so they we did a two-hour pilot. We sailed around Ensenada, and uh, we came back, and they didn't pick up the pilot. And so I went off to do another show. A year later, they're going to do another pilot. And I was uh, obligated to... The Lorenzo and Henrietta oh, Music Oh, you know, he show. worked for Lorenzo Music. Oh, wow. Carlton the Doorman. Yes. Also a terrific comedy writer. He, he is. Yeah. That's what he was. He, yeah. uh, he had seen the Groundlings. The next day he calls me and I answer and it's Carlton the Doorman. Yeah. Hello, Sandy. <laughs> Hi. I'm telling my wife Carlton is, uh, you know. And he was also what? The, uh, uh, Garfield. 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 For yes. another generation. Garfield. Yeah, yes. the voice yes. of Garfield. So he hired me and Richard Lewis as a writer and uh, Murphy Dunn. Yeah. And a whole bunch of people. Funny guys. They were all funny guys. The show was terrible. It was abominable. <laughs> I got to tell you one Richard Lewis story. Go. We had him show. on here. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, so he was just writing on the show at that time. And we had this guy, I think I'd mentioned him, Ira Miller, who Mel Brooks used to use all the time. Oh, no, actually, it was, uh, 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 Jesus, I can't remember, Cliff Arquette's uh, son. Um, David Arquette. No, no, no not the, the not, old, oh, Lewis. Yes, Lewis, Lewis Arquette. Lewis Arquette was one of the writers. Me. Yeah, the father, so, Rosanna's so, father. Uh, Richard, uh, you know, was nervous. And, so we take, uh, Murphy and I take Richard out of the writer's room, and uh, uh, Arquette takes the doorknob off, and there's a hole, and he sticks his dick through the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I love it already. <laughs> and so <laughs> Murphy and I are bringing uh, Richard, who's... <laughs> You know, and we wouldn't let him see the door. We said, okay, here. <laughs> and we're, we said, uh, 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 Richard, just open the door. And he grabs uh, his dick <laughs> and looks at it and runs screaming into the bathroom <laughs> and stands there for 10 minutes with boiling water. <laughs> his hands were swollen. Whose they dick were was red. it? It was uh, Arquette. Louis Arquette's dick. Uh, Louis Arquette's <laughs> dick, yes. From Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, I mean, that's From what the we did. Yes, we yeah. entertained ourselves. The wow. show sucked, but we had a, <laughs> we did sketches like Police Blimp. 
<laughs> we were two cops up in a blimp. <laughs> I and love then, it. And then we would have these high speed chases. <laughs> and we're going. <laughs> Funny <laughs> promise. <laughs> it was. We, uh, they paid a fortune for the blimp. They used it twice. And I think Lorenzo was buried Hilarious. in it. Hilarious. <laughs> now, Gilbert will appreciate this, Sandy. We talked on the phone. And this is fun. Uh, his first movie, Gilbert, Sandy's first movie, co starred John Carradine. And who else? Roderick Crawford. And who oh. else? Elsa Lanchester. Elsa Lanchester. Jeez. Louis Hayward. Yep. Uh, Patrick Knowles. <laughs> you know these uh, names? Yes. Yeah. Patrick, Patrick Knowles. Knowles was in The Wolfman. Yes. Correct. Patrick Knowles. Who else? Uh, Lanchester. Uh, Louis Hayward. Yeah. So uh, I started out uh, working for the company as a PA. So they were doing these really bad B horror movies. And I begged the producer, let me just, I just want to get my SAG card. So, uh, so that's, that was the first movie I acted in. But as the PA, I hung out on the set and Broderick Crawford would show, oh, Ray Milland. Did we say oh, Ray Milland? Ray Milland. Oh, Ray oh, so Bury the lead. Broderick Crawford showed up shit-faced every day to work. <laughs> every, <laughs> and Ray Milland was the ultimate professional right he in, didn't in spite like of winning an oscar for playing, for playing a, drunk. a drunk right and so uh he'd be waiting ray milan and they'd bring Roderick crawford and he couldn't walk sometimes and his face was bruised so they wanted to get the scene to get ray milan out and he can't stand up so Roderick crawford he had a cane his character so they propped him up on the cane and sort of leaned him on it and he just was leaning on the cane they yell action he opens his mouth the cane slips and Broderick Crawford is falling for like three sound stages. Oh he just doesn't fall down. You know, he's knocking sets down. Four grips are following him. And finally, like outside of the sound stage, he goes down with five guys. Fantastic. And they said, send him home. So then as the PA, when the movie was over, I had to take him to Universal to do a radio interview. And I pick him up, and he was living in a motel off of, uh, on Vine off of Melrose. And I go up, and he's got five empty gin bottles, like the milkman, outside the door. Incredible. I knock on the door, and it's pitch, I mean, so black, it took the vision out of my eye. You know, <laughs> I'd never seen anything so dark. And he's like, <laughs> I had a Fiat, which was this big. And he comes down the stairs, and I literally had to stuff him in the car and get in the car. Wow. And he's breathing, and the windows are steamed up. And he's like, he was talking, not to me, but he was talking to someone. Stuffing a drunk Broderick Crawford into a Fiat. We got to Universal. He did the interview perfectly. Like, you know, wow. sober. Then the interview's over, and then he's shit-faced again. Let's stop uh, for a drink on the way back to the motel. Sure, whatever you want, Broad. And uh, he said if I ever had any scenes I wanted to rehearse, I should call him, you know. And uh, about that? I didn't. Uh, you babysat for a, for a bombed Broderick Crawford. Yeah. Hey, I once read an interview with this guy who directed a movie called uh, Big House USA. <laughs> that was a prison breakout movie. And, it, and he said that the cast was... Roderick Crawford, Lon Chaney Jr., right. and Ralph Meeker. And he goes, I don't want to tell you the drinking going on. <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, yeah. And Chaney God. Jr. took a backseat to no one. Oh, as, yeah. As yeah. far as the boozing. Oh, man. Well, he, uh, you know, he. Uh, did you ever see his movie where he played uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover? Yeah, Larry Cohen yes. movie. Right. Yeah, we yeah. had Larry Cohen on J. the show. J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he was, in his day, a terrific actor. Yeah. Most what was that crazy thing you told me about Carradine and Bogart? Oh, John oh. Car John Carradine was also in this same movie that uh, with uh, Ray Milland. And yeah. All. So again, I would. Sit what was it there. called? The Terror of the Wax Museum. Terror in the Wax in Museum. The Wax Museum. They they hired. <laughs> they, they, Sounds they, good to me. They hired all these mimes to play wax figures. Oh, jeez. And so these shots were always quick because you don't want to see a guy go like yeah, this or blink. <laughs> so so I would sit there and I would talk to and John Carradine, who was very arthritic. You know. Yeah. Uh, so he's telling these stories. He was like the first one to get into sailing. He had a big sailboat, and he says he got everyone, Bogart into sailing and Dick Powell. And so uh, during World War II, 
Um, I had a friend also uh, whose father was Dick Powell and his mother was Joan Blondell. Wow. Jeez. And so they had what they called the Newport Navy. And all those guys, Bogart and Dick Powell, and they'd uh, go out in their uh, boats at night and uh, sail along the coast, making sure the Japanese do not invade Newport Beach. <laughs> <laughs> Started their own navy. <laughs> and they're all shit-faced, and they're shooting guns. And you, oh, shit. Uh, uh, he said as a kid, my friend, he would see just guns going off, you know, and they were just kept shooting out towards the ocean to make sure. And my friend, who was Dick Powell's, he was on a yacht with his father, mother, Bogart, and Lauren Bacall. Wow. And he was a teenager, and he was staring at Lauren Bacall's ass. And she turned around and looked at him. She said, you get enough? You know, and he turned red, and he was so embarrassed, and you know, but he uh, uh, he grew up, you know, in the in the golden era, and he became a producer. Sure. You know, did you interact much with Elsa Lanchester and Carradine? Uh, yeah, we used to go out and we would have a threesome. Uh-huh, uh huh. Great. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> John's fingers were so uh, crooked. Sometimes it, it felt okay. Not bad. Uh, no, no, it was okay. No, yeah, go to lunch with him. Uh, uh, now they just would work. Uh, and there was also a very famous uh, Japanese actress. I can't remember. Okay. They were there was nobody under seventy in that movie. Right. You no, know, you were me. a kid. I was a kid. I played yeah. an English uh, newspaper guy. I love that. And so. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. But at that time, also at Paramount, when I was there as a PA, they were shooting Godfather Two in Chinatown, and I had my bike, and I'd go from soundstage to soundstage. Good time to be there. It was, and Frank Sinatra did his comeback special at Paramount, oh. and it was on the stage across from where I had my little office, security all over. But I'd been there, so I could. I went in the Happy Day soundstage and worked my way into the Frank Sinatra soundstage. Love it. He and Gene Kelly are singing and dancing, and they're doing The Lady is a Tramp. And so uh, Gene Kelly's dancing, and Frank is singing, and Frank goes, that's why the lady is, that's why the, he says, are there any ladies here? No, no ladies. That's why the lady is a cunt. Doom, doom, doom. <laughs> and Gene Kelly just went, well, Frank, that's not how you're going to do it, is it? He said, no. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I thought comeback, you know, but uh, yeah, so that's what he did. And um, Frank could be a little vulgar. Well, <laughs> ask me a pharaoh. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I like this story, too. Uh, this And Gilbert will also appreciate this one, which is the... Uh, by the way, uh, Sandy knew Pat McCormick, but we'll talk about oh, that. We'll, sa- yeah. we'll save that. <laughs> Sandy and I worked on a project with Pat McCormick, which you yeah. didn't know about me. Oh, That's right. Yeah, but he also knew Jack Riley. Jack Riley. Who's uh, come up on this show a bunch. Yes, yes. He introduced me to Mel Brooks. Oh. Actually, he, didn't, he set me up. He, he came to see the Groundlings, and uh, he lived down the street from us, and... He said to me uh, after the show, he said, would you like to meet Mel Brooks? I said, no, no, I have, I, I think I'm going to the dentist. I, I thought he was kidding. He said, no, I'll really set up a meeting. I think you're funny. Mel will like you. And so I go in to meet, and again, it was like Groucho, my, another icon. And I could, so his office is like the size of Madison Square Garden. I go in the door takes me 10 minutes to walk from the door to his desk, and I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm sweating, and Mel's just sitting there. He's watching me. He's watching me. And I finally get there. And he says, uh, took you long enough. Sit down. <laughs> and he, so, so we, start, we start to talk, and I made him laugh. And I, I got up. I said, I'm going to go. He said, where are you going? Why are you going? I said, I made Mel Brooks laugh. I'm gonna quit show. That's bu- it. I'm gonna quit show business. <laughs> That's what I have a picture of me and Groucho, and so he sits me down and we talk, and he says, "You know, I like you. I was gonna give you a small part, but now I'm gonna give you a bigger small part." And so was the first one high anxiety. I had anxiety, and I had the scene with him and Madeline Kahn, who was great. You mm-hmm. know, and then then I never had to audition. He would just call me, and for. Uh, the second one was what? Yes, history, history of, the of the world. History of the world. So I come in, and I'm going to play Einstein, and they do a two and a half hour makeup on me and mustache, and and I had to sing, and I don't sing at all, <laughs> at 
oh, I can't even say a song title in tune. So he, they're having me sing, and Mel was playing Hitler, and this other guy was playing Freud. And the scene was ice skating. We were going to ice skate. And um, so I come in, and I'm going to sing the song, and the musical conductor, John Morris, is singing in my ear, and I'm still singing. Also, uh, Jackie Mason was there to sing. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he was there dream. to sing. His song was... I'm sitting flicking chickens and I'm going through the pickings. All of a sudden, the goys back down the walls. And he did, 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 did. <laughs> he, he, he sang worse than I did. <laughs> Unbelievable. And so. Uh, but Einstein didn't make the cut. No. Yeah. So uh, he cut the whole skating thing. So he calls me again. He says, I want you to do The Last Supper. And that was with John Hurt. Yes. Play Jesus. Jesus. Sure. And I was the apostle, the first one when he comes in, Mel. And uh, um, Art Metrano was in that oh, scene. Oh, we had Art here. Yes. Really? Yes. How was he Art was doing? Da Vinci. Yes, he, <laughs> he was, was Da Vinci. He did the last. Yeah. And, the last and my pictures. And, last, and, you know, yes. I show that to my kids. They don't know Jesus. They don't know the Last Supper, you know. And, <laughs> they don't know Art Metrano. <laughs> they don't know John Hurt. <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, we did it. And it was a lot of fun. Then afterwards, um, we go back to the dressing room, and John Hurt is just like a wooden curtain between his dressing room and mine. And he taps on the thing, and I say, yes. He says, hey, would you care to come over and have a drink? I said, sure. And I opened the curtain, and like an avalanche of empty booze bottles. See, oh. we have this connection with booze. I'm not an alcoholic. I know. But, but I was ankle deep in empty booze bottles. Almost every story we talked about it's, on the phone involves some, alcohol, some form of, 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 abuse, of abuse. Yes. Of self-abuse. And we sat there till like midnight till the security threw us out and drank. And again, all those British actors. To me, it's like, oh, I'm sitting here with John Hurt, you know, and we're both drunk and they're throwing us out of Fox. Getting blotto um, with Jesus. Yes. T speaking of Brits, tell Gilbert the Ringo story because that one's also fun. And then the Laurence Olivier, which I didn't tell you the tail end of that. Tell me. Uh, my wife cast this movie, The Jazz Singer, with Neil Diamond. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Gilbert, yes. Gilbert does a bit for, about it. And, and um, oh, what's... Uh, uh, Luc uh, uh, Lucy Arnaz. Lucy Arnaz. And Laurence Olivier. Olivier as who, the father. <laughs> who has the classic line, I have no son. <laughs> very good. <laughs> that is very good. So uh, uh, he brings a, uh, a uh, not an acting coach, but a woman to help him run his lines. And so my wife and I go to the hotel, and we're sitting with that woman talking, and out of the bar comes Hume Cronin, William Holden, and Laurence Olivier. Man. Shit-faced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit-faced. <laughs> They're like weaving, walking behind each other, weaving. And I'm just, I can't believe it, you know. As William Holden walked by, I said, watch your head. Don't fall oh, down. Oh, I'm sorry. You kid, you kid. I kid. So anyway, so uh, a tradition in the movies is uh, the casting director calls the actors for their first call. My wife had to call Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> I'm on the phone upstairs. And she calls me, goes, hello. And he was staying at a hotel. She says, um, um, uh, what do I call you, Lord Olivier, Mr. Olivier? She just called me Larry. And I thought, she's not going to call him Larry. She says, well, Larry, I have your call here. It's 8.30 a.m., stage four, scenes 10 through 12. He says, okay, uh, what sound stage? She says, 12. What studio, Goldwyn? What scenes? This went on for 15 minutes. What? Sound stage twelve. Oh my god! Sound stage, <laughs> and my <laughs> wife said, "I'll make sure the AD." Uh, and the woman drove him back and forth. But he just, uh, what scenes? Okay. <laughs> what movie? <laughs> yes, is this where I do the soliloquy? You know, you're not my son. Oh, I remember how, the way he said that line. I don't have. He was amazing just to watch, but he was doing it for the money. Yeah, he oh, did. yeah. Oh, absolutely. You think he needs to work? He made with a bunch of those for the Neil money. Neil Diamond and, and, Sean, Lucy and Sean. He did for the money oh, and what? What? Betsy. Did, oh, the the one they Ray Harryhausen. Who? 
The Clash of the Titans. Yes. Right. With, yes. Uh, what was his name? Harry Hamlin. Harry Hamlin. <laughs> he's cashing a lot of checks then, Sir yeah. Larry. Yeah. Well, he's he walking had, around the toga. <laughs> right. Well, he yeah. had kids now. Even yeah. though he was 87, he finally had kids and he needed, the, you don't make a lot in the theater. Absolutely. You know? But he, <laughs> Ethan Tell Gill, and they're both fun, the Ringo story, but you you got to tell him the Jerry Van Dyke story. I'll tell him. that may it. be my favorite. And the Lucille Ball story. And we'll get to that yeah. one. So... Uh, <laughs> Which story was I going to tell you now? Well, well I think, I I think Gilbert oh, will Ringo, appreciate Ringo. Yeah. the Ringo yes. one. Well, um, as a kid uh, growing up, I had a huge nose. And uh, I had it fixed, but it did grow back. But, <laughs> but as I'm being wheeled into the surgery, the nurse says, why are you getting your nose fixed? You look like Ringo Starr. And I thought, oh, God, you know. Jump ahead, 1979, I had a, a half-hour show on CBS as an actor. And so Cher and this other woman, every Tuesday, would rent out a giant roller rink, and it was for celebrities, De Niro, Mick Jagger. And because I had a show on, I went. And so, and I'm looking, there's, oh my God, a Ringo star, you know. And every week he was there, and every week he was drunk. So, so <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm taking my skates off, and I look up, and Ringo's looking at me, and he's walking towards me. And he sits down right next to me and puts his arm around me and says, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. I thought, the show hasn't even been on yet. How could he be a big fan? He says, I listen to all of your songs. He, I don't sound like Ringo. That's it's more, all right. It's close <laughs> enough. It's more like Ringo after he lived in Israel. It's like, <laughs> the, it's like the, the actor from the Bad Beatles cartoon. <laughs> yes, yes, right. But it's pretty, it's pretty good. So he says to me... Uh, Yes, I, I I like uh, some of your songs. I, I said I'm not. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I said I know who you think I am. He said, "Aren't you Stephen Bishop?" <laughs> I said, "No, I'm not Stephen oh, Bishop." God. And he was so disappointed. He said, <laughs> "He said really." He said, "You should tell them you're Stephen Bishop because you get lots of free things." And so he was schwitzing, and he smelled from booze. I took my handkerchief out and I gave it to him, and he, wh- oh sorry, wiped himself down. Gave me back the handkerchief, and I have it sealed in a plastic bag. <laughs> and we may take some DNA out of there. Get that one up on eBay. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I wish I, you know. More, ring- more drunkenness. Yes, dr- a Ringo will get much less money than Paul. But anyway, it'll, it, that's the way it worked out. Yeah. Uh, the, the Jerry Van Dyke story also struck me. This is every actor's nightmare. Well, it was like when I, uh, you know, uh, just did the pilot for Love Boat, but didn't come back and do this series. So Jerry Van Dyke, uh, his friend was Sheldon Bull, which is a writer. He wrote uh, the old uh, Bob Newhart show and created. So he created uh, the Newhart show, and uh, he calls uh, Jerry, he says, I wrote a part in for you. It's yours. You don't have to audition. It's yours. The innkeeper. Uh, yes, the, one the, inke- the innkeeper. Uh, Tom uh, Poston. Yeah, so, so he uh, uh, says, okay. he calls him a week later. He says, you know, CBS just wants you to come in just to meet. And Jerry Van Dyke is, no, I hate those meetings. They never liked me. He says, you don't have to read. Just come in, meet the CBS people, say hello, and that's it. He goes in, he meets them, he leaves. That night, Sheldon Bull calls him and says, I'm sorry, Jerry. You know, Bob wants Tom Poston. And Jerry Van Dyke goes berserk. I mean, crazy. <laughs> he says, I knew I shouldn't have gone in. And, and so his, he goes furniture shopping with his wife after this. And he's out of his mind. They go into this antique furniture store on Ventura Boulevard. In walk two guys with guns. And they're going to rob the furniture store of the cash because it was high-end stuff. And they yell, everyone on the floor, everyone down. And Jerry Van Dyke says, I'm not getting on the floor. Go ahead, shoot me. I lost a series. They (laughs) recast me. And the gunmen start to back out. And he's following. Go ahead. And they run down the street. And he says, please kill me. I don't want to live anymore. And then 
Finally, Sheldon Bull put him in coach. <laughs> that was also his show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Isn't that but, great? Uh-huh. But, you know, there's so many people, you know, there, there were like uh-huh. 10 guys who were going to play uh, the uh, uh, a part in Jerry Seinfeld, the uh, Jason. Um, oh, the, J- oh the, the, the George Costanza George, part. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I think Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. But all these actors, they all, I had it, and then I didn't have it. You know, it was. Well, you got to work for Mel. Brooks. Gilbert didn't even make it because they replaced him with oh, who? Oh, yeah. I, I auditioned for uh, Life Stinks. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and it so was, did the movie. Yeah. No, uh, really. yeah. <laughs> and, and I got, of course, the classic Hollywood thing. You're, you're who we want. Right. You're it. <laughs> and, and then uh, I, it turns out I didn't get it. And I said, well, who did they get? Billy Barty. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Barty. Oh my god. I lost out to a famous midget. I uh, is a Billy Barty story. I uh, <laughs> hey, then. fire away. In the Groundlings, while well, I uh, in the Groundlings I did this character named Jackie Muldave and he was like Jerry Lewis. You know, I wore yeah. a tuxedo and the cigarette and brought people up on stage and insulted them and so they were uh, doing a benefit at the Santa Monica Civic for animals, you know, Betty White's thing, mm-hmm. and they told me Billy Barty was uh, going to do the show. I said, okay. So I'm out there doing some shtick, and out of nowhere, Billy Barty comes running out on stage, and he says, that's enough, get off there, come on, but, but he's kidding, and, <laughs> and I say, no, get out of here. <laughs> he throws himself on the floor, grabs me by the knee, throws me down on the floor, <laughs> And the two of us are rolling around, and I'm in a tuxedo. We're rolling around on the floor, and this was un- this was unrehearsed, you know. And uh, I don't know. Then we both got up, and I started. I picked them up, and I thanked, you know, did the old thank you for the award, <laughs> right. you right, know, right, right, right. But uh, there aren't a lot of people that I know have that have ever wrestled with Billy Barty, <laughs> midget, actual midget wrestling. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he's a strong. He was a strong little guy, you know. He'd grab you by the nuts, and he would not let go because that's about. Did you ever actually meet him, Gilbert? Uh, no. Oh, okay. No. Okay. <laughs> he just, I he just saves you, you look out. Disgusted. I could have. I could have gotten into a fight with him. Yeah, that's the easy yeah, part, I, you I, know. I, <laughs> right. But and uh, according to that uh, Peter Dinklage movie. Oh, oh, uh, right. Billy Barty punched out. Uh, right. Herbie Herbie Villages. Villages. Yeah. 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 Good lord. Oh, Good Lord. Well, tell us about meeting Groucho and, and, oh. and the infamous Aaron Fleming. Okay. So, um, uh, first, uh, I, uh, I went to see that concert at yeah. Carnegie oh, yeah. Hall. He was, yeah, we just had Dick Cavett here. Yeah, and, and it, it was heartbreaking. Oh, yeah. You know, during there was an intermission that was like a half hour long, and then... Uh, so you were both there yes. as kids. Yeah. 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 You were there? Yes. Yeah, he was there, too. Oh, yes. I didn't know. You so, didn't say hello to him. That's funny. I don't remember seeing you there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the lights come up, and he's standing there on stage, Groucho, and there was a guy lying on the floor running a mic cable up his pant leg. You know, and this is oh. in front of the audience. And so uh, then when I went to L.A., I got into a workshop uh, at 20th Century Fox, and Aaron Fleming was in the class. It was an improvisational workshop. And I didn't know who she was and she would come and she was sort of attractive and then one night she shows up to class with Groucho. This is in a workshop and he comes in it took him 20 minutes to get from the door to the seat but the way you did it. So uh, the teacher says I don't know do you want to work? He says I'll only work with the girls. I don't want to work with any men. She says, go ahead. And he gets up on stage, and there's a table and a chair, and he sits there. He says, okay, I'm a Hollywood producer, and you're coming in to audition for a movie. And so the first girl gets up, and she's talking to him, and he takes his pencil and throws it across the stage. He says, look, sweetheart, would you get that for me? And she bends over, and that's what he wanted to do, look at the ass. He had every girl come up on stage. He'd throw the pen. They'd bend over, and he'd say, thank you, we'll call you next. And that was the entire... <laughs> wow! <laughs> the en- wow. Rap shows dirty old man. That face. was the entire class. And then uh, I met him, and I had my picture taken with him somewhere in storage. 
Uh, I was in this movie. Sheila Levine is dead and living in New York. Yeah, you know that picture, oh, yeah. Gil? Yes. And uh, so she brings Groucho to the set. And again, I, you know, the first thing I did was get him in Groucho in the headlock and have pictures taken of me. I figured if he doesn't survive the headlock, I got the pictures. Sure. So uh, I say, I can't, you know, I saw you at Carnegie Hall. And he did that line. He looked at me, squinted. He said, funny, I don't remember seeing you there. I was thrilled. That's yeah. great. You know, great. he did. And then a friend of mine had the poster. And uh, this rock and roll guy, they had named an album, two albums. One, A Night at the Opera, and the other one, A Day at the Races. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nice segue. Yes. You know, <laughs> Well, he gave me the poster off his wall for the Groucho Carnegie Hall well, poster. Well, since you became friendly with the members of Queen. Yes. And I think, and <laughs> this is the only podcast in the world where the show, the name Midget, the word Midget is acceptable. <laughs> well, I, I won't allow any other word. But Sandy yeah. mentioned something to me about uh, a lavish uh, uh, Queen parties. Uh, you want to take it from there? <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, uh, one of the uh, the drummer for Queen moved in next door to me, and Roger we, Taylor. Uh, Roger Taylor, and we've been friends for like forty years. And the debauchery that would go on with these guys, the parties they had, you know. So they had a birthday party for Freddie. It was so. I don't know if there is a word debauched. He didn't want me to come. He was embarrassed. I said, ah, "It's okay." What? <laughs> They, it was drugs and booze and drugs and booze. They had midgets <laughs> with silver trays of cocaine on their heads. Jeez. <laughs> with a little, little, Jeez. With, wrong. with a little chin strap so it didn't fall off. <laughs> and they would walk around and they just, you know, wore a thong or something. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Midgets and thongs with bowls full of coke. Filled with coke and chin yeah. strapped to strapped to their heads. Right, this, this is like out of Caligula. It was, <laughs> yeah. And they would walk around and, oh, over here, and, it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you'd see the midgets going back into Jeez. the kitchen with an empty uh, platter, and they'd come out with another pile of cocaine on their head. Another gig you lost to Billy Barty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Imagine who you might have met at that party. Gilbert. Wow. I thought you'd appreciate that. I wrote down midgets with coke on their heads. <laughs> 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 I mean. I know what pleases my co-host. That, they they talked how, about that on 60 Minutes. <laughs> 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 midgets with coke on their heads. I, coke on the heads. They left it out of the movie. They should have put that in the movie, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody. But uh, yeah. they were just... Uh, and just you know, you got to write a book with some of these stories and the, the stuff you were telling me on the phone. About the, the, uh, well, so one time, quickly, uh, uh, my friend Roger, they're doing a show in San Francisco at the Cow Palace. So he flies in a private jet, me, my wife, and his wife, who live next door to us, up to San Francisco, and we see the concert, and it's unbelievable, it's amazing, and uh, we go down, my wife and I, and Roger and his wife, and we get into his limo. And it, the garage door opens, and it comes up from underground, and out of nowhere, girls are jumping out of the bushes onto the limo. And they're on the roof, and they're on the hood, and, they're, and the driver looks around and says, what should I do? And Roger says, oh, if you drive fast enough, they'll fall off. <laughs> One of them hung on to the 405 until we were Love lost that. in town. That but, happens to you, Gil. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? And you just would see them fall off the top and peel off the hood. And... Women leap onto your Uber, Gilbert, yeah. when, you're, when you're doing a gig in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah when I'm doing giggles. <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, we went you, to... You have been an eyewitness to a lot of very strange... Behavior. Well, yes. I mean, and as I said, debauchery is a good word yes. because that's it's a recurring theme. Yes, yes. With these people. Well, the debauchery. Uh, I told you the thing with Mick Jagger at the roller skating. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, Mick. Ja so Mick Jagger went to the roller skating yes. too, and so um, I go into the bathroom and I go into a thing. I close, lock it because I don't. I like to my privacy. Yeah, and I hear someone else come in, and I'm looking through the thing, and it's Mick Jagger and two other guys. And I'm in the toilet with the door lock trapped. He takes out a bottle this big with cocaine. And he doesn't let them. 
he throws, he anoints them like this. Oh, jeez. And the coke is flying around the room, and they're just doing it and doing it. And I thought, I got to get out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been in there 15 minutes. They don't know I'm in there. So suddenly I throw open the door, and the, as cool as I thought I was, I look like a narc next to these guys. And I walk out, and I'm like ankle deep in coke. And I wanted to show them how cool I was. I open my pocket and I take out this tiny little <laughs> bottle. And they're looking at me like, you know, and I thought, fuck this. And I put it back in my pocket and scoop up some and, and that was it. And, but uh, every week there were just amazing uh, people at that. Incredible days of Hollywood. Yeah. Days gone by. Those days are not around anymore. No, and a lot kind of, of those people are not around kind anymore of drug abuse. either. Yeah. T- take us out on the, uh, and you know, we'll have you back another time, Sandy, and co- yeah. cover things that we haven't covered because okay. there's a lot more stuff. But I do know that Gilbert's going to appreciate the Lucille Ball stuff. I ah. figured that. <laughs> oh, yeah, so. I, I like it already. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> No midgets full of coke. Uh, no, no. Uh, no. Uh, uh, my wife cast the jazz singer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they had so many. At one point, Barry Manilow was going to do it. Yeah, and sounds then, right. Yeah, and then they thought, so who are they going to get as the other leading man? So uh, they wound up hiring uh, Neil. And after seeing dozens of women, the director settled on, not settled, but he wanted Lucy Arnaz. And uh, we became friends, you know. And uh, so uh, Lucy goes back to New York, and we don't see her for a while. My wife and I are having a baby, and uh, we're at Cedars, and she just, my wife just gave birth, and we're in the recovery room, and there's a curtain we hear on the other side, a voice that sounds familiar, and I take a peek in the curtain, it's Lucy Arnez. She's laying on the bed in the recovery room next to us, and I pull open the curtain, we say, what are you doing here, what are you doing? She said, she just had a baby two hours ago, and we said, well, we just had a baby, a boy. We say, what's your, your baby's name? She says, Simon. What is your baby's name? Simon. And uh, for five years, I used to have Simon and Simon parties. And when she'd come to L.A., she'd stay with her mother. She'd call us, invite us over to swim. And the first time we went, we went up to the front door, knocked on the... I mean, her house was completely open from the street. You could, you know, you could see the house. And Lucille Ball opens the door. And we're just all standing there looking at her. I mean, our kid didn't know who she was. She invites us in. All the curtains are closed. It's dark. Not as dark as Broderick Crawford's room. (laughs) But it's pretty dark, you know. Shag carpeting, and she's playing, uh, uh, I forgot the game with a guy. Backgammon. Backgammon, yes. Um, uh, She's playing backgammon, and, you know, we're out in the back swimming and doing this stuff. And so now we're going to leave and we had we came in the front door and we start to go out the back door. She says, Lucille Ball says, no, no, you have to go out the same door you came in. And this is a thing she had. And so we had to go around and go out the back door. So then, uh, oh, so after we had the baby, there's a knock at the door. In the, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in the hospital room. I say, come in, and it's Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Oh, and I, again, I'm this guy from Ohio, and the two of them, I thought, we brought them back together, you know, and they came into the room, and she says, I want to see this other Simon, and she looks at our baby, and we talk to them, and my ears are ringing. I can't believe Lucille Ball is here. So at one of the swim parties, I didn't swim, I sat in the living room in the dark <laughs> with Gary Morton, and... uh you know, he was her... Sure, little yeah. So he's just wearing a terry cloth uh, uh, bathrobe, nothing else. Oh. And he's sitting there with his legs <laughs> spread, <laughs> and I'm looking, you know, you know, and it looked like, I mean, his <laughs> schlong, it looked like a dead uh, cobra laying on the floor. I swear, his schlong just sort of made a circle back up to his groin area. And, you know, and he's talking to me, and he's leaning, he's got his legs spread. I don't know where to look. I keep looking. Oh. <laughs> and then as I left, I said, now I know why Lucy... Showbiz. Showbiz story, yeah. Yep. Here's you know. Lucy, and here's Gary. Yeah, yeah. here's Gary. <laughs> 
<laughs> and here's the, uh, the the snake. We got to wrap, Sandy. I'm okay. sorry because I got to get these people out of here. I understand. But we will do another one. Yeah, we need we to We know do... where to find you. You can do it. You can come on Skype. You know, uh, we left out all the really funny Holocaust material. No, you yeah. <laughs> No, my parents were Holocaust survivors. Yeah, I told Gilbert. You'll come and tell us about I'm that. I'm laughing already. <laughs> it's, <time. laughs> it's a million, it's six million laughs, let me tell you. But you know. You and know. Gary Morton showed up. That's it, right. It puts the hot, hot <laughs> in Holocaust. Holocaust. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're in, you're in L.A. You'll go to the studio. We'll I'll get you on Skype studio. and we'll do another one. It sounds good. Okay, buddy. I enjoy this. Thank this you so much. Gilbert and Frank's amazing colossal obsessions. And we've been talking to the man who lost the Sidney Bernstein part. <laughs> uh, and, and I wound up the Jew doing it in Beverly Hills Cop 2. But he did get to a party with midgets and thongs <laughs> with coke on their heads. And I got to see Gary Morton's schlong. Yes. That's more than I've done. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Sandy Thank you Albert. very much. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>